Welcome to the Purity for Life podcast, episode 144, my interview with David Zaylor, Director of Operation Integrity in Monarch Beach, California. For more information on this podcast and other great content, visit purityforlife.me. Welcome to the Purity for Life podcast. This week I got to have a great conversation with a brother of mine named David Zaylor, who is the director of an organization called Operation Integrity. Operation Integrity helps men find sexual uh, purity and sexual integrity and helps them uh, discover who they really are and who they were really meant to be in Christ. And so this is a, a really great conversation. I, I count David to be one of my um, one of one of my greatest brothers in the fight in this battle and uh, this this victory towards uh, sexual integrity. So we're walking this road together, and we just had a fun conversation. I hope that you'll uh, be encouraged and that you'll find uh, David's wisdom to really challenge you and to really help you along in your recovery journey. Um, you can check out uh, more about David by going to operationintegrity.org. He's written a couple great books. Lots of great resources, and uh, there's all kinds of videos out there on him. And I'm just so thankful I got to talk with my brother. So enjoy this interview with David Zaylor. David and I just kind of um, connected. I want to say maybe about a year or two ago on on Facebook, and um, I, I'm not sure if I I found him or he found me, but we found each other. And uh, and you know the work that we both do uh, is very similar. And uh, you know I, I've um, Started to read uh, David bo- David's books and they're just fantastic. We'll talk a little bit about them in just a second. Um, but I I'm just excited and uh, very thankful to be able to talk to talk to you today and um, really looking forward just to just to hear hear your uh, hear your background your perspective um, uh, what I would consider from your from your uh, from what th- from the video that I've seen and the talks that you've done and the the things that I've read uh, your wisdom. Uh, to, to share with us, to share with myself, um, and for just you know, just for the audience, I, I am um, in my sixth year of recovery from a pornography addiction, Good and um, so I, I'm just trying to to walk strong and and keep learning, and uh, and yet I feel like there's more and more and more every single day that the Lord is just trying to kind of carve out and dig out what from within me. So, uh, but but today today's about you, David, and, and it's about just learning learning from you and learning about. Uh, you know, recovery and uh, sexual purity. And I've got, you know, some questions here. You know, David and I have exchanged a little bit and thought we would just kind of jump in. Um, you know, you, you have an incredible story um, from what I've read and seen of recovery from alcohol, drug addiction, alcohol addiction, sex addiction, pornography addiction. Um, would you mind just sharing a little bit of that background with us, David? Well, sure. Um, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I haven't had a drink in 16 plus years. I'm grateful for that. Uh, I'm I'm a grateful recovering drug addict. Uh, Drugs became really kind of part of my alcoholism. Um, But my first addiction was pornography. I discovered my dad's pornography stash when I was eight years old. Uh, And it was, uh, unfortunately, it was also right about the same time where I uh, started to suffer sexual abuse from uh, a man in my church. And so I would, I would often go to my father's pornography as a way of trying to make sense of my own experience being a molested child. Um, on top of the natural curiosity and the natural just, you know, children, when they see pornography, are gravitated to it. It's, it is fascinating to them, both boys and girls, in kind of in different ways, I know, but still they're fascinated by it. So um, it was, to compare it, it would, you know, consuming my father's pornography would be very much like drinking out of um, my father's vodka bottle. Now, my father was not an alcoholic. My father uh, worked very hard to be uh, a straight-laced guy. He was a very dedicated uh, Christian musician. 
well loved, well respected, but he never got the help that he needed. Uh, in that generation, there was really no help. Secrets were secrets, and they were guarded, and they were protected. So, um, you know, the most obvious problem was the fact that I was a molested child uh, viewing pornography. Um, what we know today about pornography, pornography essentially causes uh, neurochemical brain damage, especially in children. So I grew up uh, behaviorally having problems. I uh, got in, just from there, I just started having a lot of behavioral problems at school, um, at church, ended up flunking out of high school, worked a lot of odd jobs. Um, but I was a, I was a tough sorted little kid uh, and took that into my 20s. Where in my 20s, I discovered alcohol and uh, very quickly became an alcoholic because it was the one thing that I discovered that made me feel good. And um, I being a young person who suffered, when something made me feel good, it made a huge impact on me. That was alcohol. From alcohol, uh, I became very promiscuous, started working in um, uh, strip joints, uh, and uh, started dating women in the adult entertainment industry, discovered drugs, loved drugs for the same reason that I loved alcohol. Uh, it made me feel good. Uh, and I was always craving something to make me feel good. Um, later on, I actually began to work in pornography for, for a while. Um, I hated it, uh, but I did it because I, I, I still carried with me that fascination. And I remember being a child and as a young person, seeing these men with these beautiful women doing these amazingly exciting sexual things. And I thought, well, you know, so in a sense, in a sad, pathetic kind of way, I, I, I envied these men. Um, so I gave it a shot. I tried it. And uh, the opportunity was there, and I, I really didn't like it. Um, so I didn't do it very long. Um, fast forward, I uh, got myself in, into business. I used the trades that I had learned working, uh, started a business, made it reasonably successful. But I continued to date women in the adult entertainment business. I continued to use alcohol and drugs. In 1999, I got arrested for, for drug possession, which sent me to a treatment program. And I tell you, this is one of those things, and, and we see this in recovery. We see where God is really, uh, he's way ahead of someone. Right. Long before, they, they may think that he's, he's abandoned them, forgotten all about it, but, but his plan is unfolding Hmm. They're maybe blind to it. I was certainly blind to it. Mm -hmm. But in the treatment program, as the counselors began to know my history, uh, they began to talk to me about the reality of, of pornography addiction and the reality of sexual addiction. And really, they, they, they compelled me to make that part of my addiction recovery program. Hmm. I'm so grateful for that. Had they not done that, I don't think... Uh, I would have stayed sober very long. Wow. So uh, uh, working my pornography recovery program and my sexual addiction recovery program is equally important to me uh, as staying sober from drugs and alcohol. That's awesome. That is awesome. It's um, so in, in some ways, you know, um, you know, not to sound inappropriate, but you have a pretty well-rounded experience when it comes to understanding addiction and having, you know, come from several, several different addictions, um, you are placed in a perfect spot to minister to guys, to speak in the guys' lives about the struggles that we have with, um, with drugs and alcohol and sex and porn and everything. Well, I am um, talented in the area of sin and addiction. And uh, I, I've never forgotten that. God doesn't let me forget that. But uh, right. you know what? I'm okay with it. I'm all right with it. It's, it's uh, uh, I've, I've kind of gotten, I've learned to kind of get over the embarrassment of it all. It's okay. Well, I, you know, I, since I know that since I've come out of um, it, come into the light out of the darkness into healing out of shame. Um, it, it's, I don't know if it's, you know, the more we grow, the more we heal the, the, the embarrassment and the, the, the fear, man, it just, it just left me within, you know, six months or a year because I, I gained this courage and this strength of 
man, I want people to know my story. I want to help. I want to become whole. And the only way to do that is to tell the truth and to be honest. And um, there's a lot of power that comes from that. And um, so, you know, I just, I found that for my life. And um, so, you know, to talk about porn and guys who, who are embarrassed about it and it's just kind of a dirty little secret or whatever, man, I don't know, but um, I, I love talking about it with guys. I, I it, it might be something that's just buried, but let's talk about it. Let's get it out. And um, I just so appreciate your story in that. Um, I, I want to just, I kind of want to jump right in here. Uh, I had a couple yeah. other questions before that, that I wanted to ask, but we'll, if we have time, we'll save them. But I had to, you know, as I was thinking about our interview, I had, I had two overarching questions for some reason, the one question I wanted you to, to, to speak to and address was for the man who is um, buried so deep in addiction and buried so deep in sin and struggle and, and shame. So it's kind of a, a recovery 101 question. And then the second one, it kind of addresses the man who's, who's kind of in the, the 301, 401 place where he's been walking this journey for a while, five, six, seven, ten 10 years maybe. So maybe the first one, what kind of advice would you have for the man who is just struggling, he's hiding, um, he's he's just, like I said, just buried down so deep in addiction, um, nobody knows about it, maybe his own wife doesn't know about it. Um, wh- what advice do you give that man? Well, there, there's two action steps that I think are equally important. The first one is to seek and ask for help. You got to tell somebody. Yeah. Uh, this is where... Uh, the the recovering communities, which really in our generation they are they are exploding. Mm-hmm. Uh, the twelve step communities are they're available in in small towns. They're available in medium sized towns. They're all over the place in big towns. They're available online. Uh, counselors, uh, many many counselors are getting credentials in helping people with sex and porn addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't talk about this as much as we should in the Christian culture, because we tend to frame it in just the religious moral aspect of it. But pornography addiction is a type of sickness. Viewing pornography makes people sick. Right. You've got to have help. So uh, uh, reach out to the people who are in recovery, reach out to a counselor. Many of the clergy are available to this. The second action step, which is equally important, is get yourself safe. From the te- from the devices and the technology, um, for for a pornography addict to walk around with an unmonitored iPhone, mm. trying to get sober, yeah, it's kind of like an alcoholic trying to get sober with a six pack of beer, you know, right. in his in the back seat or a mm-hmm. bottle of vodka in his back pocket. Yeah, um, it's it's. Uh, uh, this is willpower alone mm-hmm. will never be sufficient. We have got to make ourselves safe. And I tell you, uh, the iPhone that I'm working, or excuse me, the whatever this is, it's not an iPhone. It's something else I'm working with this. I, I'm, I have gray hair. I don't understand this stuff. <laughs> I have a program on this that my board of directors knows everything I do with this phone. Good. Uh, that helps me so much. I'm never alone when the thought of like, hmm, wouldn't it be nice to look at some pornography? Uh, you know, remember that thought is always accompanied by the fact that, you know what? I'm not alone with this phone. Yeah. The same with the laptops, uh, the tablets, all of these devices need to be made safe. Those are the two starting points. Um, uh, that's, uh, I hope I answered your question on that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, that's great. Um, so let's flip the coin then. So we have the man who is, is struggling, who is that those are two incredible action steps. I, I hope you, you take them to the bank there because those are very practical and we've got to do, we got to take action on it. What about for the man who has, um, uh, what advice, what, what tips, what principles would you give to the man who's been walking on this journey for a long time? You know, it's maybe it's five plus years. Um, he's not, he's not, he's not quote unquote an amateur anymore. I guess you could say he's, he's kind of, he's, he's, he's working the steps. He's doing the action. He is uh, experiencing freedom and healing and victory. Um, you know, 
what it what and I feel like I'm kind of in this place right now and 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 it's not as if we run out of things to work on but what do we do when we're at five six seven years of sobriety and recovery um and I have some thoughts of my own but I've just I, I've been thinking this question has been pondering in my mind for quite a few days now David well and this is a huge part of what we do at Operation Integrity, we talk we talk about sustainability. Mm -hmm. Sustainability doesn't start when someone's four or five years into their recovery. Sustainability begins at day one, okay. starting with keep it simple. Keep it simple. Um, our you know our forefathers in recovery, in, in is kind of is Alcoholics Anonymous. They are huge, mm -hmm. uh, an example of a community that has transformed millions. Of lives, absolutely. And there is a, uh, a quote in in their big book that says, "All that we really have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition." In other mm. words, recovery one day at a time. My job today, on this Tuesday, is to not look at porn and to be honest with God, with myself, and with other people. That's it. Mm. That's what keeps me sober today. Learning wow. to do that simple thing day in and day out. That's the kind of thing that will not only get us to five years clean and sober, but but will take us beyond that. That's the sustainability piece. Uh, second, and there's a second part that, and I was just talking with a dear friend of mine, uh, John G. over in Atlanta. I hope he sees this, so he'll he'll know that I was thinking of him. And we were talking about this. He, he works with a number of uh, guys over there in Atlanta on this issue. And he was commenting to me, he said, the men who do the best after their first year are the ones who are helping others. To make yourself available to help somebody else. Nothing will so ensure okay. our, our enthusiasm. Uh, nothing will so give us energy and excitement for our own recovery. Nothing will make us more thankful and want to glorify our Lord more than helping somebody else. Even if they fail, you know, their success or their failure, that's not our responsibility. Yeah. Even if they fail and fall off the edge of the earth and back into their addiction, hmm. that's a lesson for us. Sure. That's, 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 uh, that's, we can learn from their misery. Yeah. But, and uh, but make oneself available, always with the priority of leading with authenticity and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Dan Allen, in his book, uh, Leading with a Limp, has a great quote. He said, you either lead with your limp or you wear a mask. Okay. Now, yeah. Make the decision there. Uh, wearing a mask is all about addiction. Mm -hmm. And it's all about isolation. It's all about secrecy and fear. So lead honestly. Mm. Tell your story to who, to appropriate people. Um, and uh, so when you, when you talk about the, the ongoing journey for three years, four years, five years, 20 years, I think that's it. Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's really great too. I love it. Um, yeah, because, you know, we're in that, I feel like I'm in that tension right now where, you know, I don't necessarily s practice the, uh, uh, some of the, the same kind of uh, tools or, or equip myself with the same kind of tools. You know, I'm not a part of a support group for me. I'm leading a support group. Uh, I don't have as many accountability relationships today. I have one primary one. So it's almost as if your your recovery kind of um, alters a little bit into maturity and growth. Um, and so you, you know, you but you keep digging, 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 which kind of leads me to my next question um, to kind of shift the focus just a little bit. Um, you know, guys, we have a, we have a hard time and a struggle uh, going inward, I think. And I wonder if, if you think that, you know, the whole idea of when we come out of addiction into the light is that we've got to, we've got to dig down and really explore the whys behind why, why does porn pull me? You know, why, why do I, why am I attracted to this particular kind of pornography or whatever it is? And it's kind of exploring the deeper level issues of the heart. Um, do you think, so what part of our recovery is that? Do you think that's, 
uh, really essential and really crucial to healing um, to explore the deeper level issues? Or is that something, because I think a lot of guys, you know, we have this kind of mindset or a lot of guys have a mindset. I just want to take care of it. I want to sweep it up. I want to broom it up and, and dust it out and, you know, just kind of change the behavior and I'm good to go, but I don't really need to go deep in my heart and my mind. What do you think about that? Well, addiction always, always. And, uh, did I say always? Cause I've been always. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> has underlying issues. Mm -hmm. Now let's be frank. When, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot of psycho-emotional issues to motivate someone to look at pornography. Pornography in and of itself is pretty compelling. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, it is a drug that it makes an instantaneous link to the very mm -hmm. core of anatomy uh, and our emotions. Um, but I do believe, a, you know, it, if a person has a bad habit with pornography – uh, they're probably going to realize it at some point, realizing that it's hurting them more than helping them, creating more pain than pleasure, and they stop. Okay? That's a bad habit. Most people do that. Addictions take on a life of their own where, where literally the tail becomes is wagging the dog. And sure. the of all of that is the underlying issues. Now, the underlying issues may be something simple, just like uh, job stress, one of the things I see is men, uh, you know, uh, high-functioning executive men, uh, stress is a huge trigger for them. When they start understanding the need, the mm -hmm. essential need to change their life and to have uh, to de-stress, uh, to live their life in a more healthy way, then the triggers start to settle down. Mm -hmm. That does they're not addicted anymore, but that's one of the underlying issues. Family of origin issues. These were huge issues for me. Hmm. I had to come to grips with everything that I was trying to avoid all of my life, and that was growing up abandoned and abused and disregarded right in the middle of a family that lived in a in a, in a relatively nice house, part of a nice church, and everybody thought everything was fine. And uh, to come to grips with my, really my emotional failures, my inability to have honest, authentic relationships with my friends. I was always showing, a, I was always showing my good side to my friends. And my inability to have healthy, wholesome relationships with women. Uh, I had to address those things. Um, and addressing those things was equally or I think perhaps even more difficult than just addressing my basic ad addictions. Um, and uh, so, and this is part of the journey. I, I got... God in his love and his grace, he leads us down the path in a very appropriate ways for us. Uh, I think God in, in, his, in his plan, he puts us in a position where we need to start addressing certain things like right now like yeah. that are behavioral issues, things that are killing us, things mm. that are destroying our relationships. Um, and then in time, God begins to reveal things. Mm. I can't tell you how many times – I remember one time not too long ago, it was over, um, well, it was in Omaha, Nebraska. I went to do uh, uh, some work there at a church, wonderful church, Westside Church in Omaha, fan, wonderful, wonderful church. And uh, as I was doing the book signing afterwards, a man came up to me, and he opened up his mouth to speak, and nothing came out. And I waited, and he tried again, nothing came out. And this man must have been six, seven 300 pounds of pure muscle. He, he must have played for the Cornhuskers when he was younger. He was a huge guy. And then he began to weep. And it got me. And I, in fact, just remembering him, I, I, I get emotional. This man had never had anyone invite him and challenge him to tell a story. So much so that he couldn't do it verbally. 
but he began to do it by shed, by his tears. Yeah, wow. And um, I'll never forget that man. Uh, but I believe that that's where, that's where he began to come out of isolation. Um, in, in our culture, we tend to kind of, we disregard emotions. We're, ta- we're actually told, don't trust your emotions. Trust your reason. Well, God gave us emotions for, for a reason. They are an important and valid part of our life. If we disregard our emotions, they are going, we're going to have problems. Um, emotions are, they're like dashboards on the, they're, they're like the lights on the dashboard of our car. Mm. They tell us things. They're communication devices. And uh, if we're aware of them and in touch with them, then we communicate better, not only with ourselves, not only with others, but with God as well. Wow. So it's, you know, so then what I hear you saying then is, you know, and I never really thought about it in this such a powerful way. The behavior is almost like this much, right? It's almost like that much. And the inside, our inside world, our heart and the issues that stem this addiction that, the, that are at the root of this addiction are everything, you know, the, the, the emotions, the feelings, the traumas, the, you know, the, 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 the deeper level issues that, um, that, that have cropped up and, and certainly the behavior is important. Don't get me wrong, but it's almost like it's just a fraction of really what the addiction is. Because like you said, we can, anyone can modify their behavior. We, most of us can, you know, can do that. We do that with things all the time. But it's the it's the heart level stuff. That's the really really hard thing um, well, that we find. Yeah, I I agree. We are made in the image of God. God is any reasonable sane person mm-hmm. is going to admit that they don't have God figured. Out. Yeah, we we certainly can have a framework of understanding, and we have a face and we have a history to look mm. at in Jesus. Um. But the person who thinks he's got himself all figured out is self-deceived. Um, awareness is an ongoing journey. Um, and awareness, healthy awareness, always precedes healthy change. Um, that's, that's a real, I, I, I can't tell you how important I believe that is. Hmm. And that's part of the ongoing journey. Um, it, the twelve-step programs. One step one reverse to addiction. Everything else has to do with reframing our thinking about God, uh, about making uh, changes and transforming our relationships, and developing an ongoing, sustainable, humble, teachable relationship with God. Um, boy, if that doesn't take the rest of your life, I don't know what does. <laughs> absolutely absolutely um so let's turn let's turn the dial back to you here for a second um in your recovery journey david what what kinds of other areas um has your healing from pornography uh you know from alcohol from drugs exposed in you and in your life and helped you to grow in um, what are the different areas that that have have kind of gone under that that refiner's fire and that that healing um, that you that you that that is different and transformed today? Well, first and foremost, I've I've learned just to be content with who I am and what my life is all about, and I can't tell you that I'm happy with everything all the time. But I've learned to be content even when I'm not happy. Um, I've learned to, to be able to have this conversation with you today is a miracle for me. I um, always wanted to be able to communicate. and But when it came to To give you an idea, this is something that I came to grips with when I was in my early recovery. Growing up, and until I was adult, an adult, 
if I ever saw a picture of myself, I would get sick to my stomach. Mm. I would feel nauseous. Just my own appearance, who I was, what I was, my history, my experience, my life. I felt shame. And um, I so wished that I could have traded places with somebody else. In fact, you know what? I don't think I would have done that if, even if I could because I, wouldn't have, I would, wouldn't have wanted anyone else to have the misery that I had grown up with all my life. Um, on a fairly regular basis, I find myself thinking this, and I'll actually say it. I have become, become the most blessed of all men. I do not need to escape my history. I don't need to explain or even make excuses for my shortcomings. And they are huge shortcomings. I don't feel the need to judge myself. Um, I am what I am. And I'm grateful for the fact that God has set a path, set my feet on a path, and he's given me people to help me put one foot in front of the other. And part of that is getting to know people like you personally. By the way, thank you for reading my books. Uh, I hope that you're enjoying them. And um, you know what? I figured I got another 20, 25 years here on this earth. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, so my ambi ambitions have become very simple. Uh, to live my life in a way that pleases my Lord and helps other people. And I just want to take a second, David. I appreciate that so much. But uh, let me take a pause here. And, and um, you know, David didn't ask me to do this or anything, but um, I, I really do want to do this. this uh, these, are, these are his books, and, and um, I think you have uh, – is it two books, David, that you've written or more? Well, there – Actually, there's three, but the When Lost Men Come Home book became When Lost Men Come Home, Not for Men Only. Okay. So that, that's basically the second version of the first book. Okay. Um, I, I I got a couple more coming. I, I just uh, – uh, they'll be unavailable at some time, hopefully before the end of 2016. So. Gotcha. So, well, here's the first one, When Lost Men Come Home. Uh, I'm digging into this one right now. Absolutely loving it. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Uh, love it so much. And then um, our journey home. Uh, his his um, the the other read here, which is just great. It's really great insights and inspiration for Christians to twelve step recovery. Um, and the first one, when lost men come home, a journey to sexual integrity. Check them out. Um, they they are they're fantastic, fantastic stuff. So. Um, well, I, like I said, I want to cherish your time, David. I just, uh, I, I feel like I could just ask you a thousand questions and I know we, we should, we just do this again. Um, have a part two sometime. That would be fantastic. Um, sure. but you I, know what? shave, take a shower and not be wearing my base. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, no, no one here minds it, especially myself. That's for sure. Because I, I'm all about like, I'm all about if I could go to work and just wear track pants a t-shirt and a hat. I would do it every single day of my life, but I have a dress code at one of my jobs. So, I, <laughs> but, um, I was fortunate to be in the office just working at home this afternoon. And, and, uh, so here, here we are glad, to, glad to be here. This, you know what? This has worked out perfectly exactly the way it was supposed to. Cool. So, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, well, listen. Uh, you guys can check out uh, all. You can check out David and learn about David and the, his the ministry Operation Integrity. And the website is operationintegrity.org. Operationintegrity.org. Um, just before we wrap up a little bit, could you just share a little bit about what you do at Operation Integrity? The kind of a little bit more specifically, the kind of work that you do and and what uh, the organization is all about. Well, yeah, uh, myself and two other men were the original founders uh, back in 2005, I believe. Uh, we were meeting informally up prior to that for a few years, and 2005 we incorporated. Uh, and kind of by default, I became the director, uh, which is okay, okay with me, that's fine. And uh, 
Uh, my job is, you know, I take care of the day-to-day -day business, but I also, most of my time is doing communications work. Um, and I love it. Uh, whether it's being on your podcast or uh, going to a church to do some education or some inspiration work, I enjoy that very much. Uh, I enjoy the writing. Um, I do a I, I, I really enjoy speaking here locally in Southern California. It's uh, cool. church treatment. Uh, it's a treatment programs and some of the churches here that have recovery programs. I enjoy being part of their process. Um, I do a little bit of, co of consulting with churches mm -hmm. who are developing these kinds of programs. Um, mm -hmm. And I do some counseling as well. Here locally, I'll do some counseling. And occasionally, I'll do a little bit of phone counseling. Um, so it uh, keeps me busy. It sounds like it does. It's a lot of great, great work that you're doing there. Um, and again, we just um, – just thank you so much, David, for your time. I just want to squeeze one last question in just because this is on my heart and mind uh, before we run. Um, looking towards the future a little bit, and it's, I know it's hard to predict the future, uh, especially with just current events and uh, culture and technology and all those kinds of things. But uh, from your experience and your background uh, and from where you've come, what kinds of challenges do you think – kind of lie ahead for men, uh, for the, for the guy who's trying to live with sexual purity, um, in our culture, uh, you know, in, in, in our, you know, in our history, you know, just, just generally, um, and I kind of tagged on the question here today when I said to him, yes, I'm asking you to predict the future. So, uh, what do you, what do you see? Is there anything? Cause I, I, I just see, um, uh, sadly, I see so much complication taking place within the culture and tragedy and sadness and, um, you know, a, a struggle for men. Um, and I see a lot of men being victorious and growing and it's so it's a real war, isn't it? I mean, it's just a war. So, um, what is it that you see that, that lies ahead for us, David? Well, I think, I think the, the advances in technology will continue to bring advances and challenge. Um, Technology has learned that sex uh, sells. Gosh, where have we heard that before? So as in the various forms of technology uh, to make pornography or uh, hookup sites or whatever, uh, these will continue to be challenges, and uh, the technology will make them uh, – will bring more challenges. Um, but I see some wonderful, wonderful good stuff on the horizon. First of all, uh, when I was your age, we didn't have these conversations. Mm -hmm. My father suffered tremendously. Mm. My mother suffered tremendously being married to him. Mm. He, and it wasn't because he was a bad guy. It's because he didn't have any help. There wasn't yeah. the conversation. We're changing that. God is changing that. Yeah. Wherever sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It's amazing. When you go to Las Vegas, by the way, I hate Las Vegas. I, I've been there as a sinner. Let me tell you, La Las Vegas to me is amateur hour. But I used to go, you know, uh, but when you go to Las Vegas, there's tremendous quality of recovery there. The churches are very adept, and there are many organizations that help prostitutes, sex addicts, uh, 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 and alcoholics, and drug addicts. Um, it's where the sin has abound, grace has abound all the more. Yeah, uh, I think in our up as as I speak, and I don't speak that much to young people, but as I do, I am astounded at how conversant they are on this subject. They're not afraid to talk about this. They've, they've all discovered it by the time they're 10, 11 years old through their iPhones. Yeah. And, um, so I, I think, uh, and communication is the first step uh, towards getting help. Uh, and the second, and, and one last point on this subject is that I think, you know, certainly in the Christian culture and the Christian conversation, we, we tend to frame this as a man's issue. Um, but it, it's a human issue. 
Um, when, when you look at the alcohol and drug recovery treatment world, we used to think that these were men's issues. But now we're realizing that it's, it's pretty well gender balanced. In fact, uh, we do have more men in treatment than women, but the women tend to be more beat up. They tend to come in in, in more desperate states because they stay out longer because no one's ever talked about it with them. I think it's essential that we begin to talk about this in general in and in, in making the application gender neutral, if you will. Now, not that men and women are the same, but you know what? They are because they're both human beings. They're both sexual. And they both they both have an interest in this. Uh, and some as a user and some as a victim. There are men out there who are married to women who who are pornography addicts, and they suffer just like the wives suffer who are married to porn addicts. Um, so I, I think that uh, whatever we can do to to enlarge the information, to to enlarge the education, the uh, the understanding of the neuroscience behind this will be huge. And especially as we begin to understand how the application of traditional Christian disciplines, not religiosity, but Christian disciplines like time for solitude, time for prayer, meditation, service, fasting, all of these things play an important role in healing the human brain. Um, and uh, a couple of books, uh, Bill Struthers out of Wheaton College talks about this. Uh, I, there's a book out, Anatomy of the Soul, uh, by a doctor back east. Just look it up on Amazon. Great, great books here. Uh, sorry to kind of ramble on this, on this topic, but uh, when we talk about the future, yeah, there are going to be a lot of wounded people. But God is showing up, and he's bringing a lot of help. And I am so proud of uh, the young people. Uh, coming behind us old folks. Uh, you guys are going to do so much more than we ever did. So thank you, Frank. I appreciate you. Well, thank you, David Zaylor, for your time. Uh, we really appreciate all the, the work that you're doing. Again, you can check out David's organization, his ministry about him at operationintegrity.org. Uh, he took time out of his schedule today to, to talk with me. So go go to the website, check out the, the material that he has, When Lost Men Come Home, and our journey home, two great, great books uh, written from uh, a man who has walked through this and more um, uh, sexual addiction, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, and has just walked into the light. Um, David, I appreciate it. I count you as a brother who's, who I'm fighting alongside with. We're fighting this battle together. And I uh, just look forward to our future conversations. Absolutely. We're going to do this again. So thank you so much, Frank. God bless you. And thank you for all your efforts.